My name is Betty Jane McCormick. I reside in Marlboro, Vermont. It's a little town about 10 miles west of Brattleboro. And in Brattleboro, I'm a member of the uh, Post 1034 VFW Auxiliary. And this year, I am the ladies president and also chairman of community service. My name is Ronald Weatherby. I'm commander of Post 1034 Brattleboro, Vermont. I'm proud to be here to interview Richard Hamilton former POW. I'm Richard Henry Hamilton. Uh, I was born in Brattleboro, Vermont on September 28, 1922. I started out on a little farm. It was a typically diversified New England farm uh, in West Brattleboro. Uh, we uh, after talking with some of the fellows in the service and realizing how the depression hit us, we had a pretty good life. We raised cattle and poultry and chickens and uh, we raised a great garden and um, we didn't lack for, for food. And uh, some of the other fellows I've heard that just were terribly deprived during that depression. When the uh, <clears throat> when the uh, we heard first heard of the war coming on, um, we heard President Roosevelt, and uh, our home life had at that time had no electricity, and we depended on a uh, storage battery to operate that uh, radio that uh, would bring in the signal into our uh, living room. And uh, at that time, it was getting run down, and the whole family gathered their ears close to that uh, old radio, and we heard FDR, and um, it was a pretty solemn night. It was about 8 o'clock at night, I think, that we heard this, and uh, it was, uh, I, I sense how did my mother and grandfather feel at that time because uh, all these boys were just just that age. And um, <clears throat> but I th I just mentioned my grandfather. I would like to say that uh, I lost my father when I was six years old, and so my mother had the responsibility of of uh, carrying on the farm and raising up her boys, and uh, we had an older sister. So when uh, I left, I was uh, waited to be drafted, and um, although I favored uh, the Army Air Corps, um, I, as I say, I waited to be drafted, and, and uh, with uh, several other Wyndham County fellows from Brattleboro. We headed for Fort Devens on July 31st, 1942. And <clears throat> when we arrived at Fort Devens, we were issued uh, clothing, Army clothing, and we had a round of shots and uh, physical exams and aptitude testing and we were there about four days, and um, next I knew um, we were headed for Miami Beach. And here we were traveling down the East Coast, and, and what uh, made me pretty happy was knowing that uh, uh, little Brooksy uh, from Brattleboro had uh, enlisted in the Army Air Corps, and he was on that troop train. So that was uh, a glimmer of hope that maybe that's where I was heading to. We uh, went through um, uh, all these states down the East Coast and, and arrived at uh, uh, Miami Beach. Well, we didn't go into barracks right away. We went into those luxury hotels that the government had taken over. That was my first 
bit of army life. And although the sergeants were, they could find something wrong, even though uh, we weren't in a barracks that had to be swept and dusted and so forth. Uh, we had to keep the brass in the, in the bathrooms. That was what they'd find wrong. And, uh, but anyway, they didn't let us forget that we were in the Army then, and, uh, and they marched us around in the, uh, around the streets, and um, there were, for this farm boy that uh, here we were, coconuts and grapefruits and uh, all that sort of thing around in the streets that had come off the trees. Uh, Probably four weeks was uh, the extent of that, and, and then I headed for uh, radio training, and that was in Chicago, Illinois. And then we were lodged in uh, the Stevens Hotel, which was one of the largest hotels in the world, and uh, I think 6,000 rooms, and there again, uh, it uh, was a little different from the farm life that I was used to. But um, I was to, I learned Morse code and radio mechanics, and we, uh, we marched up and down the streets, and I remember being on Wrigley Field, and, and uh, another thing I remember is uh, being in the cold wind after we'd marched for an hour of uh, or longer, and I remember back on the farm when you let a working team stand a minute, you threw a blanket onto them, and uh, we were allowed to just, we were just frozen up sometimes before they'd move us off, and I don't know the object, but I did uh, have bronchitis and went, had a little hospital stint there in Chicago. Uh, from there, Extensive radio training was offered at uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and and that's uh, where I went next, and and uh, that was getting toured most of the summer, and uh, and the next was uh, radio. Um, well, yeah, we were radio <coughs> uh, mechanic gunner. So we had to have gunnery training, and we went to uh, uh, Yuma, Arizona for that. And I, uh, I enjoyed that very, very much because uh, we, um, a lot of it was skeet shooting and uh, getting those clay pigeons that would come out at you. Uh, we went around a circle uh, in a pickup truck, and uh, these uh, clay pigeons would shoot out toward you. You didn't have to worry. You had the time. You could pop them, but if they went low and away, you had to be on them right away. Or, um, but uh, they, uh, they, you wouldn't get them. Uh, but I enjoyed that, and I was. It was just part of my life at home. We enjoyed hunting, and uh, but some of those fellows hadn't ever shot a shotgun, and I remember the shoulders of. One of the fellows the next day was all just beat red, where he had uh, fired his, his shotgun and hadn't snugged it up. Uh, okay, on uh, Yuma, um, it was my first Christmas away from home, and our clothes were all full of sand that was shifting and blowing. And uh, But after that, I went to... Uh, went home for a furlough uh, for a short time, and uh, I we I presented a ring to my sweetheart, and I remember her showing that uh, ring to her mother, and she says, "Oh, that's a cute little ring," and uh, and uh, Joyce was upset with her mother because she says it's not. The size, it's the sparkle that counts. <laughs> so uh, then I went back and we went to crew training in Alexandria, Alexandria, Louisiana, 
And we did uh, daytime and nighttime flying, and we were training to mold our crew into uh, an adhesive uh, fighting uh, machine. And uh, then we <coughs> um, went on to uh, uh, Kearney, Nebraska, and from there we uh, we were, I don't know if it was an issue, but we had a factory shiny B-17 that we uh, flew to Bangor, Maine, and to uh, Gander, Newfoundland, and there were many anxious moments over that cold, dark Atlantic, but we successfully landed in Prestwick, Scotland. <coughs> uh, during, uh, let's see, we were picked up, uh, I guess we had an overnight there, and then we were transported in army trucks all the way down into uh, England where we uh, picked up more uh, training. Uh, this training was, because, was uh, with uh, these veterans that had uh, seen the action, knew what to expect in combat, and so it was just getting us closer to the missions that we'd been training for. Um, uh, all went, let's see, I realized I was, uh, I was with the 8th Air Force and the 91st Bomb Group uh, was stationed at Bassingbourne, uh, which is not, it's close by to Cambridge. Um, England and uh, we uh, <coughs> and I was with the 401st bomb group uh, the 91st bomb group the 401st squadron uh, get that straight here um, so we went on started flying our uh, uh, missions and um, we saw occasionally some fighter planes, but uh, more often we saw flak, which uh, was uh, popping up in front of us all the time. But I think the worst flak that I noticed was uh, those long Munich raids where they were cloudy days and we couldn't see the ground and they couldn't see us. but. Uh, as a radio operator, I know I was uh, shooting out that uh, little bundles of aluminum foil strips. They called it chaff, and I was putting out that chaff, and I'd always think the more I put out, the more it's going to dazzle their radar and uh, interrupt their uh, altitude uh, <clears throat> where they would uh, be less, uh, well, less apt to hit us, we'll say, because of the interference that that would cause on their radar. But, uh, but generally, what we'd see, the pilot would say, well, that's our, that's our target out there, and it would just be black with, with uh, flak bursting. And, uh, and that wasn't pleasant. Uh, we had uh, flak suits, but I always felt I'd rather be sitting on my flak suit than to have it wrapped around me. When you've got a, when they're bursting under you, you've got a tender rear end that I felt was more valuable than, uh, <laughs> than having that flak suit wrapped around me. But <clears throat> uh, anyway, that was just jesting and uh, but we had to do some of that in order to keep from letting the seriousness uh, get us down. Um, as we, uh, I will want to explain about those long Munich raids. Um, I kept a record of the raids that I was on, the hours in flight, and uh, and the type of uh, ammunition 
the type of bombs that we uh, were carrying on that, those particular uh, flights. <clears throat> those uh, Munich flights were, um, were long and tiresome. Uh, we realized that uh, we were ten, 10 hours from the time we took off, formed into a flight, into a group, and, uh, and then headed for our target. Um, but it was, uh, it was being on oxygen uh, all that time, and of course, when you're up there, I remember the first time uh, with the oxygen mask on, a drop of moisture came out onto my radio table, and in no time, I realized it was frozen. It wasn't liquid. It wasn't water. It was uh, it, it was so intensely cold up there. And <clears throat> but with our heated suits, and if if they worked, uh, we were fine. I was on three Munich raids, and they were all pretty much the same. The uh, as we went over the targets, the uh, flak was intense, and uh, I remember the times when it would lift, explosion right close underneath the plane, would lift the plane. And uh, so we were, <clears throat> uh, and then of course we'd hear, and the, the flak uh, shooting through the plane would, uh, would be a little, uh, uh, it's one of those things. And uh, But on the ninth, uh, eight missions went um, fairly uneventful, except um, we didn't have, we had one abort that uh, uh, we had to return to base, but uh, that's when we got caught in prop wash from another plane and uh, and we were up high enough so that we could lose about six. I think he t uh, the pilot told us we we've, we've lost six thousand feet. And uh, and that plane, when he pulled it out, it all those engines r revved up so, and uh, we realized that the plexiglass in the in the uh, pilot's compartment was broken, and so weren't the wind the. Uh, <clears throat> And some of these other uh, plexiglass um, domes were were cracked, and and the ammunition had been dumped out of the boxes, and it was hanging in very much disarray. And uh, so uh, back to the base we went. But on the ninth mission, our target was Leipzig, and um, we. Everything seemed uh, about the same, and and we expected an escort to come in uh, at that uh, time, and uh, and a bunch of planes were spotted way back by the tail gunner, and he said they're coming around, and the pilot uh, uh, communicated that uh, well this is this is probably our escort. And uh, so that was the situation, and all of a sudden, the tail gunner says, they're coming in on our tail, they're bandits in on our tail. And, uh, and uh, sure enough, um, the next thing I knew, uh, so I got up from my radio table and headed back uh, to a waste gun which the radio operator at that time, the crew was cut down from 10 to 9 because uh, uh, the fighter planes were less frequent and, uh, and they could save a man if a plane uh, lost all its crew. So <clears throat> uh, they came in and such, uh, and I understand they were stacked so that they just raked our uh, our squadron, and uh, and it was just that uh, incessant uh, 
blast of uh, machine guns. And, uh, and not only that, but I looked at my table a couple seconds later, and here was a splinter through it. It looked like more than a uh, 50 caliber. It looked like probably a 20 millimeter went through that table, and that I was not sitting there. Otherwise, a radio operator would have been taken out at that time. <clears throat> Um, but our communication, uh, the cords that bound them together, that went through the waist, they were hanging down. Uh, the plane was just full of smoke, and I could see the, the bullet holes. I, I don't understand why I wasn't uh, flat down, not standing anymore, because we found that, uh, let's see, the tail gunner, the engineer, the navigator, and the pilot were all killed on that raking. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, and the bomb bay was on fire, and I was trying to get up to uh, communicate with the pilot um, about what was going on back there, and and that we were going to leave, and uh, the ball turret uh, man was, I could see the ball turret coming up and he was cranking up and uh, <clears throat> and so uh, the waist gunner gestured toward the hatch and and I uh, thought about the tail gunner and uh, he crawled back there and and came back and, and shook his head so uh, that indicated to me that uh, he probably didn't survive and uh, so the waste gunner went out, and I was next because the ball turret man was coming, and um, and it's something to say that you bail out, but uh, you go to that hatch, and all of the times your feet land and two or three feet down on something solid, and uh, but there was no way um, to. Uh, to stay, and uh, out I went, too, and uh, I flip-flopped around like a, a rag doll, and uh, was just turning and uh, sort of out of control until I realized that I put my arms out, and um, and that sort of stopped that uh, flip-flopping around, and, uh, and then I realized that uh, angling my hands, I could seems so control that seems so it was flight it was but uh, actually we were going down and um, <clears throat> um, I did remember the training and I just think it's miraculous how this uh, up here works uh, when there was so much confusion on that plane that um, that I could uh, realized that, okay, you're now out in hostile territory, you don't pull that chute. And, uh, and I didn't have any anxiety or feeling about it. I, um, there was occasional cloud here and there, so I could see the ground. And uh, when I got down to where I could see the telephone uh, poles and, and so forth, then I got to where I thought Perhaps I was at 5,000 feet and pulled, and uh, and at that moment I was, uh, it took my breath away and uh, was um, it was uh, a jolt that uh, I really hadn't expected. Um, I, I uh, realized that of course I was going down, and I was slowing at a much le uh, less rate of speed and. Uh, but it was uh, enough to, to, it did prove to be an injury that my back sustained that uh, finally years uh, grew out of it. But <clears throat> uh, so I landed in a wheat field um, on that hot July day of uh, nine, uh, July 20th, 1944. And uh, I was close by a building and I could see uh, Throw line in the window and watching 
and all at once she disappeared and so I pulled in my parachute and uh, there was no place to go it was it was on this edge of several other uh, it was on the edge of a village and uh, and then I don't know just a short time the whole village seemed to uh, turn out and um, there was a lead guy leading that whole bunch of uh, uh, villagers with their clubs and pitchforks and every, everyone had something. Um, uh, and uh, he was firing a pistol in either hand and I kept thinking I would uh, feel what it was like to get a bullet but uh, he obviously wasn't firing at me just enough to let me know that he was in command, not me. And uh, <clears throat> and one of the things that we, uh, I realized that uh, we had a choice of taking our 45 with us and um, I chose not to because we were going so deep in Germany, I couldn't speak German and what would I do with it? Um, and I left it home, but I believe this group of villagers were so angry, um, they would have used that on me. I uh, think it was a blessing that I left it home, <clears throat> left it back at the base. Uh, they um, got me rounded up and uh, shouting and so forth. I realized they wanted my hands up and uh, so when my hands were up then they could poke me in the back and pushed me as I walked down to the village and went around the corner and here was a um, handlebar mustache old fellow and uh, he looked at me and he said Schweinhund and spit a whole splat into my face and uh, of course that had to drip off by itself. I couldn't <laughs> wipe it off and uh, then we went in for interrogation and uh, with that May West on, which is the flotation device. Um, uh, they wanted to know what that was, and so I pulled a little CO2 that inflated that, and it, this time, I never heard it before, but it squealed like a balloon, like you could, uh, and it just squealed, and oh, they bounced back. They thought I was doing a trick, I guess, on them. Um, but anyway, everything was ooh and ah and uh, and Fritz ah ooh and uh, I don't speak German, <laughs> but I was introduced to it uh, very um, suddenly. I was taken to a little uh, prison that was uh, down in a downstairs. I could see there was a brief uh, little window uh, up onto a sidewalk, but. Uh, there were three different doors that were locked when they left me and I was on a bale of, a uh, great wide bale of straw and uh, it didn't look clean but uh, I was not, uh, couldn't be choosy. I, they handcuffed my hands behind me and, and left me there but uh, next morning uh, we found that uh, when the warm potatoes were brought in, and I was thankful for that, um, my hands were so uh, swollen that uh, I had no feeling for quite quite some time. But anyway, then we were collected uh, and um, and went to uh, Dulag Luft, which we had been briefed on back in uh, at our base, and if we were ever um, a prisoner of war would be interviewed inter, uh, at uh, Dulag Luft. And um, they, uh, the fare there was bread and water, and uh, they tried to make you think that uh, if you'd give them this information, uh, they, were, they wanted to know your crew uh, members and so forth. I suppose they wanted to make sure that uh, there weren't people still wandering around the countryside. But uh, of course, uh, we found our, our plane, of course,
according to the um, the uh, our bombardier, who was the last to get out, and he got out in the nose, and the plane was in a spin, and he didn't think he was going to separate himself from that plane because uh, of the centrifugal force, and uh, but he did, and. He was from Washington, Iowa, and he came here after, and um, we spent several days together, and so did my ball turret gunner um, come here too. And uh, uh, but the others uh, I didn't, I've never seen since. <clears throat> well, from uh, Dulag Luft, we went to Stalag Luft Four, and uh, there was one bit of after riding four days on train. We were let out. Um, there was a captain of the guard that had his guards in a frenzy because he was naming off the cities that uh, in Germany that had been bombed by the American gangsters, he called it. And uh, so the stage was set for a very rough uh, deal, uh, four kilometers to uh, Stalag Luft Four. And, uh, so when he gave his command to fix the bayonets, it was just a loud, they were so precision, it was a loud clatter of steel. And um, so they had bayonets and they had uh, German shepherd dogs that were lunging and um, we were let out of the train and onto the ground and, um, <clears throat> and uh, lined up and then we were, uh, double, we walked fast pace and we doubled, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, our Stalag look for experience was, uh, we just had uh, a desire for more food. I think when we talked at night in the, the barracks, we, some guy would yell out, send over some French fries, and uh, someone else would say, shut up, will you? And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, or uh, how about a, a steak or, or something? And, and that would annoy someone because our, our fare was far from, from that. But at one point, um, we did hear the uh, rumble of artillery uh, on, the, on the Eastern Front coming from Russia. And on the, 5th, on the 6th of se uh, February, 1945, we were taken out of Starlog Luft uh, 4. But let me show you, uh, this is where Starlog Luft 4 uh, is and uh, the Russian front uh, came from from uh, from the east and uh, so uh, <clears throat> we were put out onto the road and in, uh, in the in the winter time where it was uh, cold and snowy and I know uh, uh, we uh, I know it, we were. Uh, we didn't find a, they normally tried to find a barn or a shelter to put us in. I think we were about 250 uh, men uh, in, a, in a group uh, uh, walking along and uh, several guards uh, walking with us. Um, but we, uh, <clears throat> uh, we came out of that uh, and we were able to pick up some cans of food that had been, uh, we'd been deprived of, that they had taken out of our Red Cross parcels. And, uh, but we could only take so many. We had to take our roll of, uh, our, uh, bank, our uh, blanket roll and, and all that we had on to, for just the warmth. And uh, so uh, we started the, the days, I think, uh, I started to say about the shelter. We were offered a barn if there was one, but I remember 
and about the second night out, we were in a stump field, and it was sleeting and, and lightly uh, raining, and, uh, and that we just had to bed down right there. And I remember the next morning, I, I thought, oh my God, I was so stiff that I thought, oh, I'm never going to be able to run again. And uh, so, but anyway, that's the way it was, and, and they put a, a day's march ahead of us, and, uh, and uh, day after day, we, we, were, we were just on the road, and yet there was no destination. We were just uh, kept uh, as volunteers from joining up with the Russians against the Germans. And uh, so that was pretty much the, uh, uh, the reason that we were out on the road. But that uh, proved to be one of the cold and snowiest winters in, in several uh, years. And, uh, and we... Uh, we just kept on uh, narrow uh, roads and uh, not on not on big highways, and uh, so we crisscrossed back and forth, and uh, and it's it's been told that we covered about 600 kilometers in that uh, uh, in that uh, uh, 77 days is. Uh, and, uh, but I was liberated by, uh, <clears throat> I, I will try to picture why, uh, but uh, the, the uh, Germans had moved us on, and when you feel that you want to fall back a little bit, you, you felt, no, I'm, you never knew what was happening in the back. And uh, so many times there would be a shot and, and someone would say, well, did you see so-and-so? And, and we didn't, hadn't seen him. So you can just imagine that uh, if you were too much of a problem, you wouldn't be uh, allowed to, to go on. And so at this point, I did dare to fall back and join the sick stragglers and uh, of about a a dozen or fifteen uh, fellows that were uh, had been allowed to to, to go slower, and uh, I'd been walking on blisters and uh, and uh, yeah, we'll drop that down now. <coughs> uh, blistered feet and uh, and the personal hygiene was uh, just non-existent and and medications uh, it was very there was very little that could be done if we uh, had some uh, medical problems but um, anyway I did uh, later the, the guards just went on with the group and uh, and just left this group and we just uh, sort of uh, laid there lounged there and uh, by noon, just before noon, uh, on horseback, two Russian soldiers rode into town, and uh, and I said, uh, "American uh, prisoners of war," and and this fellow says, "Americansky," and uh, and he was, you know, they s burst into smiles. They were um, at that time uh, we were in great. Um, stead with the with the Russians and uh, so it was nice to know that we uh, we were going it was our first introduction to freedom and um, so um, <clears throat> uh, I was uh, allowed to let's see the next morning I remember um, there was a nearby barn there and some milkmaids in there, and I went in and and got some warm milk, and uh, and then uh, next I knew there was a chicken house there with some eggs, and uh, so we uh, <clears throat> uh, began realizing that we could live off the fat of the land. Nobody was 
dare to say that we couldn't, and uh, and uh, our desires were that we could, and and that's what uh, we did. But um, another um, English uh, fellow from South Dakota, and uh, and an Englishman, uh, and uh, we allied together, and. Uh, and there was here's an occupied house, and uh, we went into that, and um, and that's uh, was our home. The curtains were down, and uh, and uh, occasionally we'd hear a rip of machine gun fire during the night, and it uh, meant, I guess, that you don't go wandering around um, uh, where you weren't supposed to, and. Uh, so that I just felt that uh, was part of their way of keeping people in and knowing that they had the the control. And uh, but a very strange little story that uh, I don't haven't heard anything like it. But we heard a knock at the door one night, and and so I went to the door, and uh, we had a candle going, but. It was screened from the, so that it didn't show from outside. And uh, I realized I was looking at a, at a barrel of a gun, but here's the German insignia. And, uh, and I said, uh, American uh, Kriegsgefangenen. And, uh, <clears throat> and, the, and the, the door opened, and in walked nine heavily armed German soldiers, they, uh, they led us to believe that they wanted us to, they wanted to capitulate to, to us, and I thought, no, no, <laughs> I thought what a deal that would be if those Russian guards went through there at night and found all that, uh, but these guys were bedraggled, and they were I take it they were trying to go to the American lines, and uh, they did not want to be taken by the Russians. And uh, here they were, though, in Russian territory, sneaking back at night, trying to get to the American lines. And uh, <clears throat> but they wanted to uh, go with us the next day. We were going the next day, um, and this was close to Torgau, which was on the Elba River. And um, we had to wait for a, uh, a bridge, a temporary bridge to be uh, put together, put up to cross the Elba. And uh, so uh, that's what we were waiting for. And, uh, and <clears throat> but finally, these fellows, uh, they went down cellar. They found a crock of i bet you it was salt pork. It was uh, some type of meat that was put away, and there was dark sorghum molasses, and, and they had it on their faces when they came up. And excuse me, they were undoubtedly hungry as uh, we had been. And uh, but we were. But what I felt real strong about was the fact that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that uh, they, uh, the, their corporal, they minded that corporal because we had two chickens roasting in the oven, and and they, I said no no those were ours and uh, and they uh, he stopped his men from touching those and uh, and I and I don't think Americans would would do that they had such respect for their uh, uh, corporate elders uh, that, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, that was just an incident that I, I think was so unusual that uh, I wanted to bring it forward. But as I wandered around on the ground uh, there in an, in an old barracks that uh, uh, was full of uh, just, uh, I found some little tiny, uh, Photograph pictures of of uh, Germans in full uniform and uh, pictured with horse 
drawn vehicles behind them. Uh, but here um, is a, a warning that is dated April 23rd, 1945. And, and this is only about two days prior to when I uh, became liberated. And uh, it warns that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> it's signed by Stalin, Truman, and Churchill. And it warns uh, Gestapo and people in charge not to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, not to injure prisoners of war, not to do them any harm. And they couldn't hide from it. Um, it was their own responsibility, and they couldn't hide behind uh, their commanders or whatever uh, word that had come down. And, uh, <clears throat> but I thought that was very interesting because uh, I haven't seen any other POW that uh, has uh, mentioned such a thing. And I'd like to just mention that uh, the Caterpillar Club, um, uh, I belong to the Caterpillar Club. Uh, the membership certificate. Uh, a member of the Caterpillar Club, it says Tech Sergeant Richard Hamilton is a member of the Caterpillar Club whose life has been spared this 20th day of July 1944 because of an emergency parachute jump from an aircraft. This certificate is bestowed to the end that this safety medium uh, in the art of flying may be furthered. And uh, a few of our fellows had uh, a little red-eyed caterpillar, and I, I said, well, what's the red eye? And he said, well, that's when you jump out of a burning plane. And I tried myself to, uh, to get uh, one of those, but no, they weren't available anymore. <clears throat> Okay, this is the certificate of membership of the uh, Caterpillar Club. And uh, it's, a, it's an unusual thing. Not too many people realize uh, what, what it is and what it was for. But as we uh, uh, crossed that Elbe and got walking again, it wasn't too long. And here we were with a bunch of uh, people that were also waiting to cross, and, uh, and all kinds of humanity, uh, little carts and wagons, and sometimes a horse and wagon, uh, but, uh, but uh, just all forms of humanity were moving along the road, and some just shuffling as uh, we had been. <clears throat> uh, but we crossed the Elbe, and uh, we weren't too much, hadn't walked too long before an American jeep was uh, went by, and boy, did we flag them down. And uh, the fellows in that American jeep had, uh, in their Stars and Stripes uh, paper, they had pictures of Buchenwald and those other uh, death camps that had been liberated, and some of those gruesome pictures. And it was, um, it was just uh, shocking. And, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, then I went to uh, get deloused and uh, uh, washed up and uh, new clean clothes. And during that inspection time, they found that I had yellow jaundice. And uh, so I went to a hospital and um, spent uh, at least two weeks there and then traveled on to Camp Lucky Strike and, um, and uh, boarded a Liberty ship uh, back to USA. And when we saw that Statue of Liberty, it was, uh, 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 I can uh, just uh, sense how those immigrants uh, placed all their hope and dreams in, in that, and, and of course, we realized that that was, <clears throat> that was a symbol of liberty and freedom in our country. And, uh, 
and that was something we'd been deprived of. <clears throat> One of the things that happened in, at Camp Dix was to take uh, is to have uh, German prisoners of war uh, putting the food on our trays, and uh, and that just seemed uh, pretty strange. And uh, <clears throat> but yet uh, that's the way it was, and. Uh, we were still alive, and uh, we could tolerate that. <laughs> I, what I, one of the things that I learned in all that captivity was uh, uh, coming back that uh, you learn, you learn humility, you learn uh, to forgive and forget, and uh, the golden rule is do unto others as you'd have others do unto you, and I think. Those are things that I remember about uh, my experience as a, as a POW. And uh, then on July 8th, um, I was home and all the members of the family had gathered around and uh, I don't know, it was just a, a great day and, uh, and I know that uh, to my mother, her prayers, had been answered. Um, one of the things we did, uh, Joyce and I, we announced uh, to her mother and dad that uh, we were going to be married on July 8th, and uh, on, uh, we were there on July 8th, and on August 8th, just a month, uh, we were going to have a wedding. And uh, so we, <coughs> I, I will show you a picture of our wedding. We were married in Brattleboro, Vermont, at the Episcopal Church on Main Street, and uh, and uh, Can, you need to hold it still a bit. Oh, um, I want to zoom in on the bride and groom. Joyce had uh, always had many friends, and uh, and I had two of my brothers there. And, uh, and a brother-in-law, and uh, my best man was Phil Gunsinger. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, it was, a, in those days, it was a pretty uh, uh, good wedding. I know that <clears throat> um, Tell us just one more thing. How did your religion serve issue? Um, are we still on? Yes. Oh, we are. Yeah. Uh, well, yes. Um, as we flew some of our missions, we were praying to God that we'd come back. And uh, I think it was natural. They say there's no atheist in a foxhole. And, uh, and I think everyone was probably the same way. But... Uh, but uh, when you stop to think, uh, uh, when it's all over, uh, do they uh, do they realize that uh, it might have been uh, a divine uh, reason that they came back? But anyway, one of the things in in uh, Stalagluft four, uh, when they brought some sporting equipment into the uh, into the camps. Uh, I realized that, uh, and some uh, some reading material, there was uh, a Bible, and there were several other guys that were interested in in the Bible, and uh, so we took our turns, and uh, I discovered the 91st Psalm, and I realized that I would say, "Wow, that's got to be for a prisoner of war," and I'll and I'll recite it because I remembered it. <clears throat> He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. 
His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. For a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon thou shalt trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon thee, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So that uh, will always go with me, and I can uh, take it apart, and, uh, and it's... Uh, it, it really was, uh, it helped me in, uh, in those days, and, uh, and I've remembered it ever since. Our interview today is a special project uh, for the Library of Congress Veterans History Program. And our recording was done right here in Mr. Hamilton's home. His home is located in Marlboro, Vermont.